support after abortion, we advocate for meeting people where they are and providing options for abortion healing that best meet their needs. Uh, that could be in person. It could be virtual. It could be peer led or clinical. It could be religious, secular. You get the idea. The, uh, the whole point is, and I'm going to say this a lot, it's to meet the client where they're at and bring the healing to them. Now, let's talk a little bit about our research. Our research shows that this approach, um, whoops, sorry, I lost my place. Um, I have some notes, guys. I, I, I'm just not winging it today. So anyway, um, we discussed offer, offering secular healing and meeting people where they are, regard, regardless of their particular belief system. Some providers over the year here or so have expressed discomfort because they believe that the person needs to receive God, confess the abortion as a sin, um, experience confession, et cetera, before that they're served with healing, or it has to be a part of their initial healing. Now, our research shows that this approach won't reach a majority of women and men hurting after an abortion experience. For example, 73% of women and 53% of men who experience abortion rarely or never attend church. It's an important stat. 47% of women and 31% of men who experience abortion identify as either atheist, agnostic, or have no religion whatsoever. And importantly, too, only 16% of women and 40% of men want to be met with a religious healing approach. Let that sink for a second. So our research indicates that an estimated 22 million men and women would seek healing if they knew where to go. And after accounting for those who are open to a religious approach, that leaves a huge gap of approximately 17 million men and women who are not being cared for in their grief, in their pain, or other emotions after abortion. We believe that not delivering emotional healing contributes to perpetuating the cycle of abortion, um, meaning that the person wounded from their first abortion continues on a destructive path, makes bad sexual decisions, and ends up in another unplanned pregnancy without the confidence to make a life-affirming decision. Gutmacher reports that 45% of abortions are repeats. So that's a woman's second, third, fourth, or more abortions. And this percentage is likely to increase due to the growth in medication abortion because there are fewer interventions, barriers to accessing the medication abortion, right? So it is absolutely essential that all people who have experienced abortion have access to healing that makes sense for them, that meets their need. A colleague once said that religious pro-lifers sometimes can be said to be to see a person in a burning building, i.e. either hurt and pain, and want them to accept the Lord as their savior before they'll evacuate him from the building. Now, we wanna address this concern of some providers. We recognize that the majority on this call are Christian and who sincerely wanna help people find healing after abortion. Today, we'd like to discuss the differences between emotional and spiritual healing and our role in a person's healing journey in light of emotional versus or in conjunction with spiritual healing. To do that and to help navigate the conversation, we're blessed today to have a good friend of mine uh, and a member of the board of directors for support after abortion, Father Sean Moynihan. Father Sean is a native of Boston, Massachusetts. He entered the Oblates of the Virgin Mary in 1995 after graduating from Franciscan University of Steubenville. He was ordained into the priesthood in 2002, and over the past 20 years, he has enjoyed a variety of apostolic ministries, um, parish ministries, retreat ministry, and his seminary formation as Novus Master. Father Sean has developed a deeper understanding of the dynamics of growth and maturity in the Christian life and how to overcome and heal the wounds that hold us back from experiencing Jesus' deepest desire for all of us, that we might have an abundant life. Now, if you have a question before we start asking questions of Father Sean, please put them in the chat. Uh, we will get to them as we can. Here in just a few minutes, we'll have a little open time for those questions. So if you would just put them down in the chat, that'd be great. So Father Sean, welcome. Thank you. And please share with us a little bit about your story and your mission. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Greg, for having me on here. 
So I've been 20 years a priest, and I would say for the first 10 years as a priest, um, I did a lot of pastoral counseling. Just people, they say when you're in the parish, you're going to the school of humanity. You just experience uh, people's brokenness, uh, struggles and, and relationships and marriages and, and their personal struggle with sin, uh, their desire to grow closer to God. You, you really get the whole gamut. And so I spent a lot of time just listening to people. And one of the things that I discovered is that I had a picture uh, in my office that well, actually <laughs> it's right there. <laughs> Take it off the wall. But uh, it's, it's, it's called the masterpiece. The, the gift of, of this picture that I, the way I would use it, I would listen to someone. And very often when they're struggling with their guilt or struggling with their shame, they just, they have a belief of, of God condemning them and them condemning themselves. And, and I would just, this was, this was like my, my little uh, ace of spades that I would just pull out at the right time. And I would just say, I just want you to look at this picture and just look at Jesus and tell me what you notice. And almost immediately they say, I, his eyes are speaking to me. And I would say, well, what is he saying to you with his eyes? What is his gaze saying to you? And it is just so powerful. Most of the time, they would just receive a word of just of affirmation that he loves me, that everything's going to be okay, um, that, that I am, I'm precious in his eyes, that I'm forgiven, that they would receive a, a word of affirmation. And I would just give them discernment 101. I'm like, if the thoughts that are coming to you are an increase of faith, hope, and love. This is Ignatian Discernment 101. Trust that that's coming from God. If it's a decrease in faith, hope, and love, trust that the enemy is at work there, and that's who he is. He's an accuser, Revelations um, 12.10. And I found that just that was so powerful for people just to hear God speak to them and be able to acknowledge that. It was healing for them. But I wanted to be more equipped to be able to help people. So anyways, uh, the, the longer story, a little shorter is I, uh, I, I got certified in spiritual direction. I was called into retreat uh, seminary formation, working with our seminarians and then retreat ministry. And I just I discovered this the universal brokenness that we all have. And when I was introduced to Dr. Bob Schutz at the John Paul II Healing Center in Tallahassee and his work, I really found a way that can heal hearts because we all have hearts that are broken. And, and, and with that, um, I guess, you know, that, that, that passion of bringing people into that gaze of Jesus just returned to me and to know that all falsehood just melts away in that gaze. It's something Benedict XVI said that all falsehood melts away and there's tremendous healing that happens in how we see ourselves. God, the world, and others. And um, yeah, so when, when, uh, when, when Support After Abortion was born, um, I was already in the healing ministry doing retreat ministry, and, and I was brought on board, quite literally, on, on the board uh, to, to help bring, you know, just my understanding of the path uh, for healing and what I can help in helping others bring healing. So that's, uh, that's the short story of, of um, where I've been and my passion still is, and it continues to grow and I wanna be better at helping people heal. Thanks for sharing that. So one question quick, Father mm -hmm. Sean, um, for those on the call that aren't familiar, you, you talk about mm -hmm. retreat ministry. Yeah. Help explain a little bit about how that works. Okay, so uh, there's different kinds of retreat ministry. Uh, my order, the Alblights, the Virgin Mary, our, our, we might say our charism, our spirituality is very Ignatian. And so an Ignatian way of praying is that you really engage your, your heart, your memories, your mind, your will, your intellect. Um, and, and that kind of meditation, putting yourself in a, in a scripture scene where if you're the Samaritan woman at the well, like what do I experience as I imagine myself there? As I look at Jesus, what do I experience in that gaze from Jesus? And so that kind of prayer meditation, um, a way of entering into a scripture is, is where God meets us. He comes to us through, you know, the faculties of, of our imagination, um, our listening, our 
our ability to to feel as we imagine. Um, and so, and that's what is so exciting for me is this Ignatian pro approach to prayer can tremendously just heal hearts and and to restore the distorted image of God, ourself, and the world that that life just distorts how we see things. So, um, yeah, if that answers your question. Yeah, that's amazing. So you take that Ignatian style of prayer and you you build that into a retreat. Yeah, yeah. That's that's fantastic. So let's move on here to a question. Um, explain to everybody here the difference as you see it between emotional and spiritual healing, and 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 as you explain them both, explain the value of both. Yeah. Um, so we're talking. I want to say we're, we're talking about two things that there are one coin, you know, there's two sides of the coin, the emotional and the spiritual. And I don't think we can separate them. Um, just as, as, as an illustrative point, um, everyone who is watching, um, if for a moment you can do this, just close your eyes, uh, put your hands at your side. And once you do that, just, uh, just with your index finger, just point to yourself. When you're ready, take your index finger and just point to yourself. Now look where you're pointing. Most of us, when we point, we point to our heart. You know, sometimes, you know, depending on where our hands are uh, at a desk, we might point to our face. But it's interesting that most of us, when we point to ourselves, we point to our heart. And uh, Benedict XVI said this, not just he said it's true because it is true, it, regardless, is that our organ our heart is the organ that we see God with. And, um, and I think that's so helpful for us in just understanding like, the path for healing. Um, a, a framework that I discovered when I was working in the seminary uh, that to me just makes sense of life. And everywhere, I, every time I read something, I, I just keep putting everything back into this framework. I got this from thematthewministry.com and it's, it's very simple, but I find it very profound. It's in the Matthew ministry.com is they say that we have experiences in life that, that shape what we believe, what we believe um, creates our emotions, which drive our behavior. So there's four things. We, we have events or experiences. We have beliefs. We have emotions, we have behavior. And I would say for too long, we've looked at Christian life as behavior modification. I just need to stop that. And, and it doesn't work. We're called to live a transformed life. And where this is helpful, I think where we see the overlap between emotional and spiritual healing is that the, the ground zero for healing is not the traumatic events that we've had in our life, but it's our belief system. It's our interpretation of what happened, how I believe myself, the world, others, that's all in my belief system. And it is my beliefs that create my emotions, what I feel. St. Thomas Aquinas said that our belief, our emotions are telling us something. They're telling us we're being loved or not. And when we've got wounded experiences, it also distorts how we see stuff, how we see life, how we see others primarily how we see ourselves and how we see God. And so anyway, so that, that the, 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 the emotions and drive our behavior, why we react to things the way we do. And so I would say that when, when we recognize someone's coming with, with a deep brokenness in their life is that, yeah, we see that in your life and your actions. If we trace it back where we want to bring healing is, is going to be uh, in the area of the belief system. So someone might come to me um, for spiritual counseling or even confession. And, and I'll, I'll ask when, when I keep hearing like these lies, what I call the lies from the evil one that I'm unloved, this deep shame and rejection. I, I ask them, so what's the negative thing you believe about yourself? And then, you know, they say that, that, that I'm unwanted and I'm not loved. When do you first remember feeling that about yourself? Oh, maybe when I was five years old. But what we know with, with abortion is that there's pre-existing trauma that has led them usually to a place where they've made those decisions. And 
the amazing thing can happen when I say, you know, here, I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit just to speak truth into that. What does he want you to know right now about that belief that I'm, I'm, lo I'm unloved or that it's my fault? And then when, the, and I say, just as soon as it comes to your mind, give voice to it. Very often it's, they experience, oh, wow, that he's saying that wasn't my fault. Or he's saying that, you know, the abuse that I experienced, you know, that, that he's angry about that. Because usually in our traumas, we, God is either far off at a distance or he doesn't care. And in those revelations, we start, I call it metanoia, just the change of what we believe about ourselves starts to happen. What I found, so we, we have an emotional belief that's there that has a spiritual um, component to it. Sometimes the, the experience is that God was not there and he did not care. And in moments like that, you're, you are coming up against a wall where, where it's mm -hmm. really difficult to break through that. I've had people just say, I, I can't hear God. And I, it's really hard for me even to believe. I can't believe that he was there. And I think that when we're talking about the emotional and spiritual overlapping, it's at that moment, it's like, okay, I can't push the envelope of God anymore here. It's like, we need really to do what, what, what God did with Adam and Eve when they sinned. Where are you? Where are you at? Tell me about your story. And we just know like grace builds on nature. So like on the level of nature, just having people just talk through their story, share what their, what their, what their trauma is. Um, and, you know, it, it's amazing because science, neuroscience just, you know, confirms this, that when someone just shares something traumatic, there is, there's healing that's happening in the brain and the neural pathways between the left and the right side of the brain. So, you know, the left is your logic, your right are your emotions, your imagination, your creativity. And just when someone has the opportunity in space just to share their story, there's healing that starts happening there. And I think that when they can start hearing themselves and someone else validates them, we can walk them to a place closer where they might be able to then hear from God, um, where, where, I, where the ultimate deepest healing is going to take place. So um, I've said a lot right there. I'm just going to go like this and just going to bounce it back to you. That was a lot. That was all good stuff. And it, it leads me to a follow up. Though, given all that, mm -hmm. do you believe or do you contend, I should say? Uh, well, I don't even want to ask it that way. Let me just ask it this way, Father Sean. Can a person receive emotional healing without spiritual healing? Yes, yes. And, and I, I think it prepares the way for an emotion. I, I wouldn't say it's, it's not going to be deep and lasting, you know, but we, we start there. I mean, that's we start on a level of, of nature. And, um, and I think it prepares the way for a place of, of deeper self-acceptance. But if you don't know what your own thoughts are and your own emotions are, if you don't have someone to process that, if our organ is, if our heart is the organ that we see God and, and there's not a, a basic emotional healing, then there's no way we're going to be able to really hear from God on a spiritual level. So just to put a, a, a fine point on that, let's say uh, a guy comes to you he tells you right out of the gate, look, I don't want to talk about your Jesus, your church, none of that stuff. I had an abortion and I, I feel this. I'm angry. I'm this, I'm that, I'm whatever. What I'm hearing you say is with that guy, if you lead in with, oh, well, God loves you. Maybe that's not the the the, the foot to start off on, right? No, no. And he, 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 he can't hear it. <laughs> For one, I mean, I think you could say, you know, God left you, but they say, well, I don't believe in God. I said, well, he believes in you, but you know what? We'll just start with where are you at right now? And, um, and, and I think just getting in touch with our pain, like I've told people before, like in confession, like when they do bring it up and they say, you know, they confess their sin. And the first thing I say is I'm really sorry for your loss. And at times it's like, wow, I, this is the first time someone's even said that to me. I, I need. I need to process that. Um, they, they, they may be coming just for the guilt. I need to relieve the guilt. And there's, there's more deeper issues in their heart that they, they're not even, they're just beginning to scratch the surface of what that is. It, I want y'all to hear that. Uh, something Father Sean said, he's on one of our support after abortion, one of our key items when meeting someone that's been impacted by abortion, which is, be curious. 
And, and you touched on that, Father Sean, asking questions, right? How are you feeling now? Where are you right now? I don't, is there another way you can, I mean, is there a better way to find out where somebody's at and what they're dealing with than just asking questions and being truly curious? You know, I think I think you start there, you know, and, and it takes time. First of all, we also know that people aren't going to open up if they don't feel safe. If they, if they don't feel safe, there's there's no healing that can happen if we don't feel safe. And so I think, you know, we do that with um, our facial expressions of just concern. Um, I think the attitude of just not condemning I'm here, you know, um, that God loves you. Um, this is this is something that I say that scandalizes people, but I think it needs to be said that God does not approve of us. And I think a lot of us can be seeking for God's approval. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's possible for God to approve of us, it'd be possible for him to disapprove of us. And he's a lover, not an approver. The parable of the prodigal son just reveals that between both the sons. And that's another homily. But that, that, but the, the, the punchline is this, that God loves you. Everyone that's listening right now, God loves you. And there's nothing you can do about it. Absolutely nothing. To me, that is just scandalously awesome, profound truths. And to come to a place where I can just receive that and accept that I don't have to be good enough to be loved by him, that, that the reality is God meets all of us where we prefer not to be met. And we like to get our halo on straight before we come before him. But that's not the story of salvation. He loved us while we were still sinners. I love that. Um, and I'll just... I. I just want to share a little anecdote here. And some of you that have been on calls with me before have already heard this, but when I was 24, um, so two years after one abortion experience and, and six years after another, I was riding my motorcycle through Southern Alabama. I know it sounds like a bad joke coming. It's not. Um, and, and I saw this church and it looked really pretty. And I thought, well, I'll just go in. So, so I did, I parked my bike and I go in and I, I, you know, pulled my hair back in a thing. And I used to have more, um, walked into my riding leathers. Nobody's really looking at me all that funny. I sit down. The sermon, Father Sean, was um, on abortion. And I hadn't dealt with it. I hadn't talked to anybody about it at this point in my life. And, and, and the, the pastor that day um, talked about how abortion was unforgivable. And, and I don't know what else was said. I heard that and I got up and got out and went, okay, God doesn't want me. And I share that story because I think it's really important just to kind of piggyback and, and validate what you're saying about this, that we have to meet people where they're at. The message I received was that God didn't want me, not that God loved me no matter what, right? Um, and so I stayed away from the church for quite a while after that because I believed it. So with that, I want to move into the next thing. It, all right. Some providers have shared that they have concerns about using secular approach, um, focused on emotional healing and not sharing the gospel message of repentance and reconciliation. But we know from our research that most people hurting after abortion are not open to those kind of messages. Um, we know that they may reject even emotional healing if met with a religious approach. All right. So we also know that healing isn't a one and done kind of thing and that people typically come to us at the beginning of the healing journey, right? Right at the very beginning. They don't even know what healing looks like yet. And we often say that we want to meet people where they are today and then trust God beyond that. So with all that prefacing, <laughs> mm -hmm. can you speak a little bit about our role as Christians and in our interactions with people who seek healing and when it's effective or ineffective to bring spiritual healing into the conversation or onto a person's healing journey? Okay. Yeah. Um, oh, oh. <laughs> where I come from, I mean, it's, a, it's always, I'm always geared towards just, uh, of it's the spiritual healing because that's where the real deep healing happens. Um, I, 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 I think when there's, there's a, a level of, of self acceptance and, and that is just like finding my identity just, or beginning to be able to find my identity that my identity is received, not achieved. And <laughs> what I'm saying is the struggle for all of us. We've all kind of go to the extremes of looking for my identity and my achievements, my titles, or it's in my failures. And no, that's the negative self-talk. I'm, I'm, I'm not wanted. I'm not cared for. No one, no one loves me. We all battle with that. You know, you go to a social gathering and you're like, man, I feel like I don't belong here. I've got a wound that's going on. So I, I think that 
you know, that, that healing it, on, again, like it is on nature, it takes time. It can't be rushed. Um, but I, I think that when we can, all we can really do is just is invite them to, uh, to consider. And, and I find that just really powerful and just penetrating. It's just like, what does God want you to know? Like if we can get their ears open to hear from God, I can tell you, God loves you. God forgives you. There's hope. But man, I'm battling a lot of shame and guilt to overcome that. But when the Holy Spirit, he wants to break through, can begin to speak into their thoughts, which he does and he desires to do. That's the game changer. And I, and I think that it's just really the spiritual thing happens when you just like okay, a person that comes to you, boom, name it. Ah, where is that coming from? That's coming from the good spirit. Can we accept that? Um, I, I, that's, that's just kind of how I've worked. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. It does. And it, it's a thing that, you know, you could attack a hundred different ways and, and explain a hundred different ways, but I just want people to hear how vitally important it is to, again, meet people where they're at and, and let, I believe we meet people where they're at and the Holy spirit will do the work. Like I don't, I, it's almost for me personally, it's almost like a kind of arrogance that I got to do the Holy spirit's job because yeah. somehow he won't get around to it. You know what I mean? Um, and I'll give you an example of a guy reached out to me and, um, really close to an abortion wound. I'm talking weeks. And he said, you're not going to do this Jesus thing, right? I'm like, what, what do you mean? Well, I, I don't, I don't belong to a church. I don't go to church. I don't want to talk about this, that, the other. And I'm like, no, dude, we're, I'm just, I just want to talk to you. Just tell me your story. And I'll tell you, Father Sean, the first time we talked the first hour, I bet he dropped 27 F-bombs in one hour. Mm -hmm. uh, he was trying to test me, right? How am I going to react? Am I going to say, hey, don't you do that? Um, and I didn't. And, and we've continued to talk and we've talked seven or eight times now. And he's starting to soften. He's starting to ask me questions. Yeah. Why are you so calm? Why has this worked out this way? Why is that? It, yes, I want to tell him, look, dude, God loves you. God forgives you and whatever. But I know if I push that guy in that pain and that shame, that what I'm going to do is push him clean out of the conversation. And I lose him forever, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, look, it, we're just about 31 minutes after the hour. What I'd like to do is open up um, for some of y'all to ask Father Sean questions. I think, Ivy, are you keeping track of them? Kylie, yay, Kylie. Yay, Kylie. Oh, I love that introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, folks. Kylie so, is Mary McCluskey, um, who has had to step out from the meeting, she asked me if I could ask you her question. She said, if we experience the emotions in our body and we are body-soul unions, then don't we necessarily experience some spiritual healing to a degree when we receive emotional healing? Yes. Yes. Yeah, you can't. Well, you, we we can't say we we're a body soul compo component, and the emotions are part of that. So so yes, um, you know it, it, we always have to make distinctions. You know, uh, like discernment. We say discernment one hundred and one. Ignatius of Loyola makes a distinction between natural consolation and 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 spiritual consolation. So you know, a baby's born, and you're just I'm really super excited. This is amazing. And then you can move into a spiritual consolation. It's just like, God, I'm so grateful for the gift of this child that you gave me. Um, and so I think one leads to the other. Pastor Lisa asked us, are we safe people? If the church is a source of healing for that person, how do we surmount that? Well, what's the question? Oh, I'm sorry. I miss. I misstated it. If the church is a source of woundedness for the person, yes. how do we um, express ourselves as safe people from the church? Yeah, uh, you know that's a really good question. And I think sometimes when people have been wounded by the church too, uh, I think the first thing is we leave with humility. So I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you experienced that. Um, or you know they have their own words. You know that that they've experienced in their life, and you have the opportunity just to show. Some compassion. Say, I'm really sorry for that. 
I think that, you know, again, that's this level of just meeting people, you know, where they're at. And I think, you know, with brokenness, it also means that we have to, we have to have some great humility in ourselves and know that people are going to lash out at times and not to take it personally. Jesus, when he sent his disciples out, he goes, you know, sometimes they're not going to welcome you. And, and so, and I think of what, you know, Mother Teresa is that famous story where she goes to the door asking for alms for the poor and, and someone like spits in her hand and she goes, okay, that was for me. What do you have for the poor? And so um, when we come to serve the Lord, we have to prepare ourselves that we're, we're, we're going to get some backlash. Not everyone's going to receive us with open arms and, and not because our the evil one works in all of us, you know, that we get so our pride. If we have such an ego, if we're honest and we can acknowledge it, it's just like our pride can so easily be hurt. Our ego can be so easily bruised. And I think, you know, it's, it's just, it's to know that, Hey, that wasn't for me personally. It's because I, I stand for Jesus. I, I, I'm, I, and people are wounded and broken. They're going to have pride. I want to encourage anyone who wants to ask their question directly to use the raise your hand function. I'm going to go to the next question, and that is, um, if you're hosting a secular group and you've advertised it, you've promoted it as being secular, is it uh, appropriate to go ahead and share the gospel throughout the uh, virtual group? You know, if you're saying it's it, it's it's secular, um, you know, and that and that's the setup. Um, I don't know. I, I think it's got to be a Holy Spirit moment. Um, I, I wouldn't have it planned. Uh, um, I would just kind of respect people coming where they are. Uh, but the, if, if like you have that moment where it's just like God just speaking something to you, um, I think that, you know, we, we, we can present a truth that's from the gospel um, in a way that's just open for people just to say, you know what, just, I'm just going to just propose something and it's just on my heart to share it. And then there it is, because uh, it just needs just to be said, but uh, it's like, I'm just proposing this. And I think that's just a great just perspective to have for all of us is that we don't, we don't impose a truth on anyone, but we, we propose and people are free to accept or reject. But sometimes we can have the mentality or maybe, you know, like, oh, people say, well, don't, don't impose anything on me. Say, no, no, I just want to propose. We don't make truth. We, we, <laughs> we propose <laughs> you're free to accept it or reject it. The next question is when um, is for Greg. <laughs> Greg, I understand you had two abortion experiences. How did you first become aware of the need for healing? Well, it first came up when I was 25. Um, something in me, right? And I was I went to a therapist um, for some other past trauma stuff. And I don't mean to say that flippantly, but I did. And so I'm sitting there with my therapist and, and I brought it up to him. I said, Hey, look, um, there was this abortion when I was 18 and, and things seemed to change in me and da, 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 da. And his response to me was, uh, I, I don't think that's really a thing. Tell me more about your stepdad. So, so I knew something was going on, right? I could feel it. I just couldn't find anybody to validate it. Um, my one dip into a church didn't help. My one dip with a therapist didn't help. And so I tried to forget about it for a while. But I, but I knew it was there. And a follow-up, did the experience of that sermon alienate you from religion? Oh, sure. That my grandma's church, which is another story. But yeah, um, I spent the good part of my 20s looking at every possible religious philosophical system I could other than Christianity. Um, it, everything from, I read the Mahab, Bharata and the Bhagavad Gita and the Torah and, and all that, trying to think the Jewish thing, maybe the Christian thing was wrong and, and went into all kinds of weird new age philosophy stuff and what I call existential light, which is what modern new age bunk is. But yeah, so I tried to do everything I could. And, and, but at that point in my life, it's important to understand I had already read um, the gospel and, and most of the new Testament at that point. And, and, my mind kept coming back to that. It kept coming back to this idea that, that maybe people are wrong about this Jesus dude. Maybe he will forgive me. Maybe, maybe there's a chance and then I would drift away and then I would come back. And it wasn't until I got married and my wife and I decided to find a church that we actually walked into a church and I began at 30 to learn the truth of the gospel. So it was a long banged up journey for sure. 
The next question is for Father Sean. Uh, if we meet people where they're at and consider that they're not in relationship with Christ, how do we get them where we think they need to go, which is into relationship with Christ? Yeah, um, you know, here's the amazing thing um, that that it's really become for me a um, just a view of understanding, you know, what holiness is. Um, and, and holiness is that God wants to use our wounds personally, you know, to transform them. Like, I want to become a saint, I want to be holy. How? How? How does that happen? What does it look like? And it's like, I think he wants to come through our own personal wounds and brokenness. Everyone who's listening right now, it's just like, you want to grow in holiness. It's like, man, your wounds are, <laughs> you don't have to look too far. It's just, Lord, where, where am I broken? Reveal to me that. And so I, I think that the, just knowing that it, it's, it, it's not one and done, it's a process. And that, you know, the more that we remain to kind of engage with someone in their story, we're going to go to the deeper levels of the heart because the heart longs for God. You know, we're made for love, created for love um, and desire love. And I think sometimes we have to go through that. There's several layers of just where we look for love in all the wrong places. And when we're able to see that, I guess it's a grace that can happen, obviously, through our prayers for them, really to come to um, a place, a place of contrition in their heart. You know, we, we make the distinction in, in the church, in the Catholic Church, between attrition and contrition. Attrition is, is imperfect sorrow. You know, I'm sorry I did that because I would go to hell. Um, contrition is that, you know, that this is this is deeply hurt someone I love. And um, we want to we want to bring them, you know, into that. Uh, that encounter with the Lord. And, and guess what? The encounter happens with us. We are Jesus's eyes. We can be. You know, how you look at a person, if you look at them with, with, with a heart of, of condemnation, they're going to feel it. But if you look at them one of great compassion, which Jesus has, and non-judgment, they're going to receive that. And, and very often, I think sometimes they're so hard on themselves, maybe thinking that God will go easy on me somewhere in the back of their mind, when we are, when we are just present with someone and loving them, it's just through our eyes, just like praying for them as we listen to them. I think the Holy Spirit just takes over really to bring to place a person to vulnerability, to soften their heart, which is hardened. Uh, Ezekiel 36, 26, I, I want to take your hearts to stone, give you hearts of flesh. Um, it doesn't happen like that. Kathy uh, or Kathia, I'd like to invite you to come on camera and um, and share your question. I'm going to ask you to unmute. All right, Kathy, are you there? Yes. Um, Wonderful. So um, I thank you for um, so much for having this session. Um, I work at a prenatal clinic, a life-affirming prenatal clinic, and, and so this is a jewel for me. Um, but also a, a abortion has hit um, my home um, through one of my siblings having it, and um, she's currently with child, decided to keep this one, and um, has not addressed um, the, one, the one that she shared with me and the other one I found out about through a Walmart receipt. Um, how, I mean, I've, I've been, I've been the, I've been the wayward sister turned religious now, now compassionate. How do, how do I even approach this subject matter? Should I approach it while she's with child or after she's given birth? That's, so it's two questions. How do I approach it and when would even be yeah. appropriate? I don't know. Yeah. Um, Greg, I'm going to, if you want to jump in, can I, I mean, just I'll start it like this. And then if, if Greg or, or someone else wants to, to be able to respond to this, um, I think the win is, is always going to be, um, it, it, that's a Holy Spirit thing. And I think your prayer for it. I mean, I, and asking other people, I think just, Lord, give me a window, give me a door to open this. And I, and I think there's so much that's in your heart right now. And I can feel it for her, like leverage that and just like, Lord, give me a window, give me a time and then show me the way. And, and just, um, there's this moment where it's just like, I don't know if there's a textbook answer for that. I, I think it's just like, 
you've got a lot of your own experience that 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 you you you've gained from this and what you're where you are right now in life and lord give me the words give me your heart and um and then you know it, it might be it might be i don't know it might be just like i i know that that has happened in the past and i i just want you to know i am sorry i am sorry for your loss see where that goes you know you, you start the conversation you see if she's open um i think there is something to be said about while she is um, pregnant it's just like you know wanting to be very cautious about not creating a downward spiral within her uh, because something that I've learned in just in my inner healing uh, work is that there's no psychological difference between the mother and child the child feels what mom feels mm -hmm. and you know it's just like man if, if self-hatred and condemnation just comes you know just hits her upon a time we don't know how long that's going to be baby receives that um, and I just found that just really enlightening, uh, for just understanding, you know, some of the wounds that, that we all have in our life. It's like, well, they might be rooted during those times of, um, while we, while we were in the womb, but, um, that sounds like, I know that's a lot, but I, my first and, thoughts. And thanks, I, thanks for I agree with that Father in. Sean. <laughs> I agree with Father Sean. I just want to share a little bit about, um, at support after abortion, we talk about when you encounter somebody that, that has an abortion experience, there are kind of four things we like to do. Um, now, I realize there's a different emotional connection because this is your sister, right? And, and that can be hard to separate. But I just want to talk about them just a little bit. The first thing being examine your judgment, whatever that may be about her or her place in the family or your place in the family or your relationship or why she did it or I... You, Check that, you know, be honest with yourself about that. The second thing is walk in compassion. Um, I agree with Father Sean. I would not dip into that conversation while she's pregnant. Mm -hmm. But, and so that's where part of that walk in compassion comes in, right? Find that, that place in your heart where you know your approach is going to be in the right way and from the right place. Um, and when you get to that moment, offer up the opportunity to her, ask her if she'd like to share her experience with you. And then now I'm going to go back to, unfortunately, my days in sales, but you ask a question and then go four deep. So get her talking about how she feels. And, and I think that'll inform that what the, the final step in the process or the final thing, which is how to help her get the help she needs. Um, it, it's a, it's a very simple, I don't want to say it's a formula, but it is kind of a formula. It informs the way I talk to every single human being I bump into that has experienced abortion loss. And the cool thing is I'm, I'm learning to talk to every single human being I bump into considering those elements. So I don't know if that helps you or not. Uh, it does make a difference. And, and I think it will help you open the conversation with her when the time is right. As Father Sean said, when the Holy Spirit shows you that the time is right, It'll help you open up the conversation in a way that'll be beneficial to her and to you, I think. Yes. Thank you all so much. Thank you for your question, Kathy. Uh, I'd like to introduce April Kelly, who has a question. Hello from Omaha. Um, I am grateful for this time and I have really learned a lot and appreciate a lot of the sentiments. My, my question is, what do you do with the person who comes to us and wants to know how in the world God can possibly forgive them for the sin of having an abortion? And I know Father Sean was talking about guilt and shame, and this is certainly shrouded in that, mm -hmm. but I, I would love to know how you might answer that kind of question. Yeah, well, I, I would say the question is perfect because this is God's domain. <laughs> Life is God's domain. And, um, you know, and Jesus, Jesus, you know, for obviously we're not, now that opens the door for a faith perspective and conversation, which, which really allows us that that's our strength. You know, Jesus died on the cross for you and for, for everyone, but let's say for you and for that. And there's no such thing as, you know, it's just like that sin, it cannot be forgiven. Um and, um, and, you know, I, 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 I think I would just say that just this is understandable that you're battling with that. And, um, and I think and I also I come from just, you know, a tradition of just understanding, you know, discernment, like, what are the thoughts that are going through your mind? 
how do you know what's coming from God? How do you know what's coming from the evil one? So in John chapter eight, I think it's 40, 44, that that Jesus calls him the father of lies. Revelations 12, 10, he's the accuser. And so how do you know it's the father of lies that's telling me that I can't be forgiven? Well, is it an increase of faith, hope, and love? These are the movements of the Holy Spirit. If it's a decrease in faith, hope, and love, that's coming from the father of lies. And um, so just know that, that this is a battle that you're experiencing right now. But I think sometimes when you give a little bit of a, of a kind of a discernment 101, because we have to take, we have to make, take captive every thought and make it subject to Christ Jesus. I think that's Corinthians uh, 510, I think two Corinthians 510. Take captive every thought and make it subject to Christ. It says, does this sound like Jesus? And we look from the gospel because we need to see it. How did he treat the woman who was caught in adultery? Is there anyone left to condemn you? Neither do I. Neither that's do I. There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. And that's the power of, of God's word that I think we, we can say, we can speak it and just say, I understand it's going to be a battle going on in you because that your belief system has been wounded by your experiences. So mm-hmm. that's my, I want to call it my short answer. That was great. Thank you. Next, I'm going to introduce iPhone pink case. <laughs> <It can't control. laughs> Whoops. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Kim Catola. And um, I have a question for you, Father Sean, and just a quick comment too. Um, when I did not believe God could forgive me, even though I was a Christian and I understood the cross, I think that I could not accept my own depth of depravity i think that was really uh maybe one of the key spiritual issues that how much i needed to be saved from myself and my life circumstances and the other thing i think is i when you're holding on forgiveness toward others it's very difficult to believe god can forgive you so those are two things i've really picked up in the field talking with people um my question for you is you know i love this insight about the psychology of mother and child together and as a woman who has experienced abortion how do we help facilitate the healing of our children our subsequent children after abortion because surely i mean um you know, my, my pregnancy with my second child was extremely stressful and traumatic due to mental health issues of, of her father, but that was maybe 10 years after the abortion, which also was unhealed. So there's just so much, you know, psychological uh, and spiritual baggage there. Uh, do you have, what, what are your thoughts about that? Um, yeah, uh, if, if, if we're seeking healing that's happened in the womb, and, and, I've, and I've heard of this, there, there are children who are born later uh, from, uh, from, from someone like your second that, that's had a abortion, then you have subsequent children that uh, it's not uncommon, at least I've heard about it, read about it, where, where children experience like this sense of, of rejection, like they've internalized something like I can be easily uh, just discarded. Uh, so that, that's, again, there's a spiritual perspective. It's like the evil one, you know, wounds us and he, there's, there can be a wound in the womb. And so um, if someone is ready, it, it depends on where they are spiritually. I would say like one way, you know, just how I would approach it is if, we could introduce them to a way of praying. Um, and it's like a meditation. It's like, what would it be like to be in the womb of Mary when she's leaving Nazareth and she's on her way to see John the Baptist or in that encounter, can you put yourself, maybe you can be John the Baptist or maybe you could be in the womb with Jesus. Sometimes um, that hmm. kind of like placement um, opens an, a, a place in our heart as a child, uh, as a baby in the womb that I, the Holy Spirit, I believe, can kind of bring healing in there. Not everyone would have maybe the capacity or the readiness to kind of enter into that kind of prayer, but uh, that would be my, my go-to. Um, this, is, this is an amazing thing. Like when we pray in an imaginative way like that, and we imagine ourselves as children, we, 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 we lose some of our cycle, our adult sophisticated attitudes and 
there's there's like a real I think a naiveness or an openness in the heart of when we place ourselves as children or a baby that gives access for God to heap to bring healing on a much deeper level, you know, psychologically, spiritually, emotionally. Beautiful. Thank you. Sorry, the next question that we have is how should a man approach a woman who wants to have an abortion where he does not? And I thought perhaps Greg could answer this question. I'm going to answer under the assumption that he is the father of the child. Um, So, you know, I get asked this a lot. Um, when I talk to pregnancy centers, like, what do, what do we say to the guy? What would you say to a guy? What would have made a difference to you? And it's really simple to me. The, the encouragement that would have made a difference for me sitting on the abortion clinic steps when I was 18 would have just been somebody, a man saying to me, hey, look, buddy, I know you're scared. I know this isn't what you had planned. But you're already a dad. You're already a dad. In this moment, you're a father. So now let's figure out how to do this father and thing the right way. Um, y'all, I can't tell you, and, and I'm, I get kind of, ch- every time I talk about it, it, the difference that would have made for someone to, to encourage me. And, and the other thing is this, the lie I believe back then, and, I, and I, I protested when her mother said, hey, she's pregnant, we're having an abortion. I said, I don't think that's right. She said, that's what we're doing. And, and guess what I defaulted to? Oh, okay, so... I guess what I'm supposed to do now, what I hear all around me is that I'm supposed to support her and whatever she wants. Um, that was the wrong thing because what she needed for me, and I believe what, what most women in that situation need from the father of that child is for him to step up and say, hey, you know what? We're going to figure this out. One way or the other, this child matters. And, and so for me as an 18-year-old kid, sitting in that sort of vacuum of not having anybody there to give me that encouragement, that, that, that just little nudge. And it sounds simple, y'all, I get that, but I'm telling you, it doesn't take much when you're heightened anxiety and fear and worry and concerned and all that for someone just to say, Hey, take a breath. I, I get, you didn't want to be here. You didn't plan to be here, whatever, but you can do this. You've got this. And by the way, here's some resources to help you figure out this fathering thing. Next question is for Father Sean. Um, First, a comment. Father um, Debbie just reminded us how much she loves that you keep bringing us back to the Holy Spirit in everything that you're sharing with us. Uh, Another person's question is, my priest told me I should not share my abortions with my living children. Listening to you now, would you agree with that advice? Uh, my, uh, I'm good, but you're going to love this Holy Spirit answer then. Um, that's going to be something that's got to come from the Holy Spirit. Um, I, I do. And I, I think at some point, you know, it, it, it's, it's timing. Um, but um, I, I obviously, when if you're going to share that story, it's, 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 it's something I, I deeply regret. And, um, but it, and it can help them. I think it could help them in the future. Just kind of like this is why wow, this is very real. I had a sibling that 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 died from abortion. That because um, there, there's sometimes like they say suicide can be a wound that just kind of runs in family and generation, and and abortion can as well. So I see there's a lot of grace in being able to raise it. But I mean, like, it's not something you just do. Like okay, I think next Friday is a good time, you know, just to bring it up. Um, I, I believe that if you start praying about it now and looking for the opportunity, it will come and then you'll see the door and it's been prepared for them to receive it. And I think it can be a healing for them and just really say, okay, wow, an awareness of this has happened in my story. Maybe they need to go through some mourning or just be able to be, be uncomfortable with that. And, and I think it's a good way to feel uncomfortable with that, that um, we can stop future cycles. But I don't have like a, yeah, you should definitely do it right now. Or it's just, I think it's a prayerful thing. And then when it's time, and that it might be three years, five years from now, but I would never say never. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, Janice Adams, if you could turn off or turn on your camera and come on. 
Hi, yes. Um, my question is in regards to the statement, a wound in the womb. I work mm -hmm. in a pregnancy center. Um, we have had an influx of women and men contact us for virtual support where we haven't though been tapping into those pregnancy center clients who do have an abortion in their past as indicated on the intake. Is it best for us to suggest going through a healing group to that pregnancy center client while they are pregnant or waiting until after they've had the child? Um, that's, that's a great question. I don't have a clear answer for you you know, on that. I, I, I think you know, it really depends on, on, on the person and, and where they're at. You know, do they have a deep faith um, root within them right now that you think that they can, they can go through this? There's a lot of emotions. So I'm like, I'm like, mm. um, I want to be sensitive to, um, you know, uh, to the, to the child. And I, I don't have a yes, no answer on that. I really think it has to do with the individual. And, and if they're feeling called and drawn, then I'm like, follow that, you know, follow that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't have a lot of experience with that to speak with any kind of authority. Given the time, I'd like to uh, conclude this uh, abortion healing provider webinar and invite uh, you, Father Sean, to just pray us out. Okay. Um, before I do, I just want to just say a few resources if you're wondering where Father Sean gets all this stuff from. Um, a lot of the healing <laughs> stuff I've learned from uh, Dr. Bob Schutz, the JP2 Healing Center in Tallahassee. Great book, uh, Be Healed um, by Dr. Bob Schutz. And um, What's my other one? Um, just looking, I had a bunch of books that are in front of me right now. Um, uh, Healing the Hidden Self by Barbara, um, uh, her last name's ex escaping, but she goes through different seasons of her life and she has a little prayer um, in Healing the Hidden Self on healing the womb uh, and, and in the womb. And so that, um, if, if that's helpful. So, um, and, and just because this was a question, if there's a question about a confession and reconciliation, it, we, we don't want to rush that um, just to get rid of the guilt because we want the individual to be able to personalize the baby. And so if anyone wants to go to confession, by all means, but I wouldn't rush it until they've been able to work through the depersonalization that they had to go through to have the abortion so that there can really be a place of, of contrition and experience of, of what I've been given for, not just the guilt. So uh, John Dillon has a great book on that called A Path to Healing. So Lord Jesus, I thank you just for the gift of, of everyone who's attending this conference and the hearts that the desires that they have in their heart to be your hands, to be your heart for others. Lord, that desire came from you. So Lord, I pray that we all just may more uh, just connect our hearts with yours and let you work through us to heal the wounded that are, that are among us to heal ourselves, that we can be wounded healers for others. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, descend upon you and rock your world this day. Boom. Amen. Thank Father so Sean, much, thank you. <laughs> thank you for being here with us. Thank everybody else for attending. Uh, quick reminder, watch your emails for re a recap of the meetings and please join us next month. It'll be April 19th at noon Eastern time. In the meantime, you got a whole month. Why not jump on our training platform, see what you can find out, huh? <laughs>